Father, as we come before you now, Lord, as we, it's time for your word, Lord. It's time for you to speak to us. Lord, we ask that you speak to us loudly. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts now. Lord Jesus, I want no one but you to lead this service, this message now. Your hand be upon this message. And Lord, remove me from the pulpit, even if you have to. You stand here, Lord. May I be your mouthpiece, a, a quote-unquote mailman delivering your message. Father, open our hearts. I pray that your spirit anoints the ears and hearts of those that are here. I pray that you anoint my lips with your words. Bless now the going forth of your word, Lord. We commit it to you. And we humbly know that if we expect it, we will be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. I spent this week battling about the message. I went up and down, up and down. Honestly, if I tell you when I decided I was going to speak, you'd laugh, and it was yesterday morning when I woke up. I actually had a message prepared on Wednesday, and then I redid it yesterday. So, just wanted to share that with you guys. <laughs> So, who, who knows who Martin Luther is? Martin Luther, no? Not Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a, a great uh, theologian. He was actually the guy that started the Reformation of the church back in the 1500s. And he was always under heavy, heavy, heavy persecution. So one day he came home and he was very depressed. Constantly going in and out of the house, depressed, depressed, depressed. So one day he came, he was married to a very um, wise woman. Uh, a German woman, her name was Kathy Van, I don't know her last name, Van something. She came, he came home, she met him at the door, she opened the door, he opened the door, and she was wearing all black from head to toe. All black. Basically, in mourning gear, like when I say mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. She was mourning. And he looked at her and he said, she, uh, he said to her, who died? And she looked at him and said, God did. And he goes, Woman, you're out of your mind. What are you talking about? What do you mean God died? She goes, well, if the great Dr. Martin Luther is going to walk around grumbling as if God died, well, obviously he did. She's making a point. God is alive. And the same God we read about is the same God that's alive today. So the title of the message, well, there it is. All things are possible. All things are possible. Possible. I want you guys to get excited. I need a little encouragement. Some amens would be great. Um, all things are possible. Amen. All right. So if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, and if you don't, there are Bibles in the pews there. Actually, we're going to put them right up there. there you, wow, that's a lot of verses. Youth group, I can do it. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 29. This is a story that we, a lot of people are, are, are familiar of, but it's a powerful story about a father who comes to Jesus with faith that's lacking. Weak faith. Little bit of faith. I'm trying to make a point. So let's read. Mark chapter 9, verse 14 through 29. I'm reading in the New King James. I know that all the other versions are probably different, but it's okay. Mark chapter 9. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them, and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, it's a very powerful verse, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when, they, when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, 
all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to him, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he, be and he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. It's a lot of verses, I know. But it's, it's a powerful passage when we look at it. I, as I always, when I stand up here and I always teach the kids, I always say whenever you see a, a Bible passage, there's always a parallel somewhere in the Bible. The best commentary for the Bible is the Bible. So these, this passage specifically is also written in Luke chapter 9 and in Matthew chapter 17. And I say that because there's always different variations. When I, not different as in it's a different message, but there's like different details. Luke says something, Matthew says something. And we're going to look at it. So every time you read a, a Bible passage, look, there's always a reference. Turn to it. You'll read it. It'll speak to you differently. By way of introduction, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says, And without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. Please understand one thing. I say this to all of us here. You don't need perfect faith. That's what people fail to understand. You don't need perfect faith. You just make sure you go to the perfect Savior, okay? You gotta make sure you go to the perfect Savior, all right? right this message, uh, this passage right here, there, there's a background too. Right before this, it's gonna be a quick uh, background. Jesus was on the mountain. He went up on the mountain with his three disciples, Peter, James, John. A lot of people say that these were his favorites, but it's not true. I tend to believe that they were probably the weakest. That's why he took them along the most. Come see, come see, look what's gonna happen. They're up on the mountain. Jesus is there. He unveils himself, so to speak, and says, look, look at my God. I am God now. You're gonna see me in my glory. Elijah, Moses, representing the law and the prophets are there. They're talking. Many people believe that they're talking about his death and resurrection. So now, of course, that happens, and they're coming down the mountain. Could you, I mean, personally, Peter, when he was up on the mountain, he said, Hey, Lord, it's awesome to be up here. Let's just build houses and live here. And I agree. But that's not why God called us. That's not why God called us, unfortunately. Something, as I was studying this yesterday, I, 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 God spoke to me. He says, John, you know what you have to do is you have to live in glory, but be in the valley. Your heart, your mind, your, your, your walk should be always in glory, walking hand in hand with Jesus. But you're in the valley. We just read it before. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. So what happens? Glory is always followed by what? The valley. And that's what we're going to study today. Actually, in Deuteronomy 11.11, 11, God said to the children of Israel, He said, you're going to go into the promised land. And that's a picture of the Christian walk today. It's not heaven, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a picture of the spirit-filled life. But you're going to have mountains and, and valleys, He said. We all know this. We go to Harvey Cedars. It's like four days of heaven on earth. Harvey Cedars, yeah, we lift up our hands. And then Tuesday comes. <laughs> There's the valley. You're, you're faced with what? In the morning, you wake up late, you go to work, something bad happens at work, and immediately God's like, okay, let's see what you learned. And that's what God's trying to teach these disciples. There's many lessons here that we're going to look at. And I believe God's going to speak to this church today because he spoke to me, he dealt with me last night. And I believe that he'll speak to us, and I pray that it's in a loving manner. It's in a way that convicts us where we're like, that's it, no more. I am going to believe that, you know what, Jesus, with you, all things are possible. We're not ordering him, but we're saying with you, all things are possible. And the first way we're going to look at, all things are possible. You know why? Because we're never alone. 
We're never alone. And that's in uh, uh, verse 14. Uh, it says, and when he came to the disciples. Now look, understand this right now. You, you, go back 2,000 years. And I always like to do that. I always make it like, like a cartoon. I like movies and acting and stuff. You know, <laughs> I make it into like a little movie. So I'm like, okay, I'm looking at it from up above. Jesus is on the mountain. He's talking to the Father. Elijah, Moses are with him. The disciples are with him. Think now, is that not a picture of today? Jesus is up in heaven. He's with the Father. You have Elijah and Moses, the law, everybody's there with him. The apostles are with him. And we're in the valley. The, the nine disciples were left in the valley. But understand this right now. Just as Jesus came down then, he comes to us daily. How many of us are Christians today? Christians, Holy Spirit living inside you. Jesus is with you. John 14, 18, uh, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. In Matthew 28, 20, when he sent the disciples out, what did he say? He said, and you can be sure I'm with you always, even to the very end. Why do we not believe that? And honestly, personally, I struggle with this. The hardest thing for a Christian is believing that Jesus will never leave us alone when we feel alone. It's when we feel alone, because when we're in church, Jesus, you're here. You're here. There you are. There you are. But then the minute we go out, we get in the car, we're, I feel lonely. Jesus? But he's with us. We have to get one thing. Our Christianity is not based on a feeling faith. It's a fact faith. This Bible is the word of God. It's the truth. When Jesus says, I am with you, he's with you. And he comes to you. This was one of the stories, actually, I was, I was tempted on teaching. Do you know the story of, of, of the disciples in the boat? Not the one where Jesus walks on water, the other one. Where Jesus is sleeping in the boat. He's in the boat. They're freaking out. Jesus, don't you care? Jesus is like, what are you talking about? I'm right here. I'm in the boat with you. If you're a Christian, you're in the boat with Jesus. We have to stop this battle in our mind. And honestly, it's just a battle in our minds where we struggle with, Jesus is not with me, but he is. He is. He always is. He'll never leave us alone. The Bible says, I will never leave. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That was in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. There's a reason for that. Old and new. From the beginning to the end. Jesus knows the beginning from the end. That's why Jesus kept saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. What does that mean? I'm with you from now until forever. Now, the one thing we want to see as we read this, it says that Jesus comes to our rescue. And he will, I don't think I have that, Lana. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> Jesus comes to our rescue. When you read the verse, there's, it says in verse um, 14 that the scribes, we're disputing with them. That word disputing is very, um, the language is a little different than we understand. Dispute is a fight. They're not fighting, they're arguing. What they're basically saying is they were trying to prove the disciples wrong. They were basically saying, you guys can't cast out the demon as we read. The disciples were trying and trying. In fact, if we read very carefully, it was the night before. So they were working all night. So what is the scribe saying? You're wrong. Your Messiah is wrong. All you're doing is a bunch of hogwash, basically. And does, not, does, does the enemy not do this to us today? He tries to discredit us. He tries to say, and, and this is the most common thing, and I know we all struggle with this, but God doesn't love you. Or... You're really not saved. That's the, like the, 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 the biggest one now. You're really not saved. You have no power. You know, you know you're on your own. Where's your Jesus now? It's like this echo in our ears the same way. But see, we have to understand. I mean, sadly, we do fall to the lies, and that goes from, from the, the, the most, quote, unquote, holy person down to the person that just came to Jesus yesterday. Jesus warned us. Jesus warned us in John 10.10. 10. He says, the thief comes only, speaking of the devil uh, specifically, comes only in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance. That means to the full, to, to overflow. 
Whenever we talk to kids, we always want to say, don't believe Satan, he's a liar. He's a liar. Don't believe Satan, he's a liar. Don't. Jesus will never leave us. We have to believe it. We have to believe it. And honestly, we have to let him come to our rescue. We have to let him be with us. Sometimes, and we're going to read it later, that there's a word that, that we use here, unbelief. Whenever there's unbelief in us, immediately Jesus pretty much doesn't exist in your heart anymore. But Jesus wants you to know that, you know what, I am with you. And I do come to you. Just let me. I will rescue you from your problems. Let me. The second thing we see is that all things are possible when we run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. We see, I'm not going to read all of it, but it's, we saw that all the people were greatly amazed and they were running to him. They were running to him. Now, why were the people greatly amazed? I was like, why were they amazed? Like, they knew Jesus. He was there before. This was in Capernaum. They knew him. Many scholars believe that when he came down off the mountain, he was still glowing. He still had that glory upon him. So they were like, whoa, we read about this in Exodus chapter 34. Moses came down off the mountain from being with God for 40 days, and he was shining, Jesus. But there's a difference between Jesus and, uh, and Moses. I read this, I thought it was awesome. Moses was glowing from the outside. Jesus was glowing from the inside out. Now, when we spend time with God, I believe that because we have the Holy Spirit in us, we can glow from the outside, inside out as well. So spend time with God. Now, did Jesus know what was going on? Because when I read this, I see some of Jesus' humor. I mean, not in a bad way. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to make Jesus like, you know, uh, a jokester. But I see him working. He, he, he wants to speak. So look what he does. Did he know what was going on? Of course he knew. He knew the details. Now look, what does he ask? Hey, what's going on over here? What are you guys discussing? What are you guys talking about? Now the desperate father speaks up. And I, lo I love this as a dad. Uh, I love it. Everyone else didn't say a word. Everyone else said nothing, right? If you read it. In Matthew, that's why I said now you have to see the different sides. Matthew, it says that the man fell at Jesus' feet. He fell at his feet. The second, in, in, in Luke, it actually says he cried out. I mean, I don't want to cry out here, but if I were to cry out, I would scream. Jesus! Like, I don't even know what he was doing. But I could just imagine, he ran through the crowd and he saw him and he fell on his feet and he says, Jesus, please help me. And that's what we have to do, we have to run to Jesus. In Philippians 4, 6 and 7 it says, be anxious for nothing. There's a lot of anxious people in the world today. A lot of anxious people in the world. Be anxious for nothing. Another translation says, worry about nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Please note that the disciples couldn't help the man. The disciples couldn't help the man. Remember, they're humans. We're humans. We're all humans. Sometimes we want help from humans and it's great. There's nothing wrong with asking a brother or sister. But in the end, we can't really help all the time. There's one who can help, and that's Jesus. That's why the man saw it. He's like, you know what? Obviously, these guys can't help me, so I'm going to go to Jesus. That's why we have to run to him. You want to see all things become possible in your life? You've got to run to Jesus. You've got to run to Jesus. And I love this. His arms are always open. His arms are always open. You go to a friend. I don't have time right now. Could you call me back in like an hour? No, I need help now. No, no, I don't have time right now. I'm busy. I got other things. Jesus doesn't say I got other things to do. Could you imagine? Lord, uh, time. Stop talking. I got to take care of the Middle East for five minutes. I always go to the Middle East. I'm from the Middle East. That's why. So his arms are always open. Let's run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. And we've all felt this in our lives where we run to Jesus and we're like, wow, there's only comfort by Jesus' feet. There's only comfort. 
Now the message gets a little bit more exciting, I'm hoping. We want to hear some more amens now. Now, <laughs> all things are possible even with imperfect faith. Imperfect faith. Honestly, imperfect faith is better than no faith. Imperfect faith is better than no faith because no faith means what? God's power? You basically put a cap on it. You limit it in your life. Imperfect faith is better than no faith. Look what Jesus said. He says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Who is he talking to there? He says generation. But who is he talking to specifically? He's speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to the scribes. And a lot of people believe that he was speaking to the Father. Which is kind of harsh. You're like, whoa, that's mean. It's not mean. The disciples... If you read back a couple chapters, they were just sent out two by two. Everybody knows that, right? They came back, Jesus, we cast out demons in your name. We healed people in your name. Jesus like, what happened? What happened to that? What happened to that? The scribes visibly saw Jesus lift up a crippled man. They visibly saw a leper, which was unheard of. Jesus put his hands on a leper and says, be clean. I have a battle with this personally. This week, everyone was asking me, how's the message going? I don't know, I'm not ready yet. It was Friday people were asking me. I don't know. I don't know. Because I'm, I battle. But you know what? God is saying, John, come on, seriously? Are you going to really argue with me? Let me ask everyone a question. Has God ever let you down? Think of it seriously. Yes, he has. I... Has God ever let you down? When you think about it. He's never let, thank you, Varush. He's never, thank you, youth group. I got my, yes. God has never let us down. You know, the children of Israel, the Bible says that no nation, no people, has seen more miracles than the children of Israel. Why didn't they go into the promised land? Unbelief. Miracles don't increase faith. Jesus increases your faith. The Bible increases your faith. Miracles validate your faith. Actually, in Psalm 78, um, the Bible says, this is speaking specifically to the children of Israel, but you take it personally too. Is it up there? No. Okay, I don't think I put it up there. Good. <laughs> Not good. Psalm 78, 41 to 42. The Bible says, yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember His power. The day when they redeemed Him, them, from the enemy. As a Christian, haven't we been redeemed from the hand of the enemy? Have we not been saved by Jesus? Basically taken out of the claws of Satan? Yes, we have. Now, honestly, I think that's the greatest miracle of all. God chose to live in my heart, your heart. The, the faith Jesus wants from us is not leftover faith. It's not fake faith. He wants an honest faith, a growing faith. Faith that grows. See, there are many people that come to Jesus and they're like, let's go to a hospital. I want to raise the dead. Really, easy. You just read like one verse. You came to Jesus last week. You want to raise the dead? Yeah. No, no, okay, easy. Because that person will like that eventually. Jesus is like, I'd rather you start here and step up one by one by one by one. I think I have the next one down, Laura. Go ahead, skip it. Yeah, that's all. I read this and I thought it was unbelievable. Faith that is planted in the soil of hope, watered with the word, which is the Bible, and rooted in Jesus, where it will help in moving mountains. That's the kind of faith God wants. He wants our faith to be planted in hope, which is the hope of Him, water it with the Bible, and root it in Jesus. Where you know what? Then you can make mountains move in your life. You can make mountains move in your life. Romans 10, 17 says, says so then faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. 
Now, this is where it gets a little bit more, um, I guess, emotional, a little bit more touchy, a little bit more, um, more personal now. You see the condition of this boy. I don't know how old this kid was. No one knows. Doesn't say it. But it's terrible. I mean, Satan has a hold of this kid. This kid's being thrown. Basically, it's so bad that the only way out for this child is he wants to throw himself into the fire and be killed. But when I read Jesus' reaction, I was like, what is... What does Jesus say? Jesus comes, the, God, the man told him everything. Jesus comes and says, so how long has he been this way? Je Are you serious, Jesus? You want to ask me questions now? Could you heal him first, then do it? Then we'll talk. We'll talk for hours. How many of us want results without communication? We want Jesus to do something today, but we won't take the time to speak to him or him to us. Jesus was drawing faith out of this man. See, I think personally, when the man saw Jesus, as little as his faith was, we're gonna see it, he still knew that, you know what? He's okay now. He's okay now. The more you speak to Jesus, and he speaks to you, the more your faith will grow. Jesus wanted this man's faith to grow, Please get this, regardless of how imperfect, no one is, is expecting us to have the, the faith of the Apostle Paul, even though even his faith was lacking at some time. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he's so discouraged. We as Christians have to say, you know what? I don't have perfect faith. I really don't. It's actually bad, but I have some. And Lord, that's what I'm coming to you with that son. We all have needs. We all have prayers. We've lifted up to Jesus. All of us here. Lord, I give you this. I give you that. Lord, <laughs> this. Especially this. But the thing with that is if, 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 if we what are we if we're not talking to him how's he ever going to answer? I believe Jesus can do all things. I really do. As long as it's his will. Sometimes you're like, well, do your will already. But Jesus is like, well, wait upon me. Wait, it's coming. But he wants a relationship. Jesus is not a genie. He's not a thing you find the way. It'd be kind of cool. Right? But he's not. Unfortunately, he's not. Parents, if your child comes to you and says, yeah, um, dad, mom, I want this. Okay. And you, don't, you never see their face ever again. Next day. Mom? Yeah. Me 20 bucks. Okay. They don't sit. They don't talk. They don't share. They don't open their hearts. Eventually, what is the parent going to say? You're just using me. You're just using me. And I think Jesus wants that kind of communication with us. And honestly, parents, and I say this as a parent, I say it in love, please don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. But we have to take the time to speak to our kids as well. We have to take the time to speak to our kids. As God the Father desires to speak to us, we must speak to our children. We must love them, encourage them, teach them, direct them, Dare I say, pray with them, pray over them. You have no idea as a parent, you have the authority over your, parent, over your child to pray for them. And God will honor the prayer of a parent that prays for a blessing over his child. And honestly, I struggle with this myself sometimes. Our own personal agendas. TV is not more important than your kids. It really isn't. I'm sorry. Satan. We, we, a couple weeks ago, we saw that, um, that thing um, 
AB 1266 in California, by the way, I just want to let you guys know, they did get 620,000 signatures in California, okay? So keep praying because they're tallying the votes, all right? But Satan is foaming at the mouth. You know what he's saying? Yeah, let your kids go. Cool, no problem. You don't have to talk to them because then I'll take them. But we have to take our kids back. As parents, we have to take our children back from the hands of Satan. And that's what this man is saying. I want my kid back, Jesus. My child. He's not Satan's child anymore. He's mine. That's right. I don't scream like that in youth group, sorry. <laughs> the next thing we read quickly is, is the man says, he says something that really struck me. He says, Jesus, have compassion on us. Help us. Wait a minute. The boy was demon-possessed. Not the man. This man was crying for help, but he said us. And it spoke to me. Now look, this could be something, because this spoke to me, maybe this is, will speak to you as well. Could it be that somewhere or something in his life opened the door for Satan to do this in his family, this condition? We do realize that what we say, what we do, what we watch, what we hear, this doesn't only affect us, it affects those we love a lot. The effect trickles down. But you could put a stop to it. We could put a stop to it. In essence, this is what the man is saying. Again, I don't know, but this is what spoke to me. This is what, he, in, I, I kind of changed the words around. This is what he's saying. Jesus, maybe I messed up. Maybe I messed up. I don't know, but if I did anything, please have compassion on me and my son. I don't want what I did to hurt him. I think as parents, we all need to pray that. We all need to pray that. Lord, I don't know if I did something. This condition my child is in right now, maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. It was a desperate cry of a parent. It's a desperate cry. And honestly, we see the, the, the compassion of our Savior. We see the compassion of our Savior. Look, really quickly, the Father says, Lord Jesus, if you can, if you can, if you can. Jesus turns the word around. Look at it, it's, it's like a, a word game Jesus plays. Jesus goes like this, if you can, really. You know, all things are possible for those that believe. Not if I can, if you can, he's saying. If you can believe saying that to us today. If you can believe, can you believe? Can you believe that situation in your family? Can you believe? At work, at home, can you believe? Not, Lord Jesus, if you can. No, Jesus can. Can you? Can you? In Matthew 7, 7 through 8, the Bible, Jesus said, the verse is very popular. It says, ask and he shall be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. The Greek translation actually, this, this, this version that I got says it like this. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and to everyone who knocks the door will be open to you. Keep on, keep on, keep on. You pray today, pray tomorrow. You pray tomorrow, pray the next day. You pray the next, you get the point. I can just keep going on and on and on. And that's what Jesus is saying. You prayed once, that's it. Pray again. Pray again. Knock on the door. Knock on the door. Look, let me tell you something. If a house is on fire, you don't just knock once and move on. You keep knocking. Who's inside? Who's inside? Jesus wants us to keep knocking at the door. Jesus, help. Lord Jesus, I need your help. You know that story in the Bible about the, the unjust uh, judge? That woman keeps coming and nagging and nagging. and na it's, I, I say nagging, don't misunderstand me. But that's what Jesus wants. Not nagging, asking. Ask. And the man's answer was, I believe, one of the most honest I've read in the Bible. It was desperate. It says, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. How many people battle with unbelief? I do. I'll raise two hands. I'll raise my legs if I can. We battle with unbelief. And I almost pictured it like this, and, 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 and I, I, I don't have a picture, but I'm going to do this. But I'm almost picturing the man on the floor right now. Jesus is saying, you know, if you can believe, 
All things are possible. And the man is saying, Lord, I believe, help me. I'm almost picturing Jesus go like this and put his hand on the man and kind of lifting him up. Honestly, if he didn't, Jesus would be the most cold-hearted person in the world. And he's not. In Luke, that's why I say always read the different... In Luke, it says that this boy was his only son. Was this man's only son. So why is that important, John? Jesus, who was the only son of God, knew what an only child meant to a father. Jesus understood this man's heart. He was an only son. Jesus was an only son. This man was an only son. And he's like, I understand. I'm an only child too. I'm an only son of the Father. And I'm with you in heart. My compa I have compassion for you. You know what? And what's funny is I read this and I, and, and, and I read this and I was like, you know what? This is so true. How many times has Jesus helped only sons, only daughters? But when it was for, for him, the only begotten son, to hang on the cross, who was there to help him? Nobody. And he did that for you and for me. He did that for you and for me. He's a compassionate Savior. Imperfect faith, yes, but he'll have compassion on you with your imperfect faith. He'll, he's going to save. He's going to rescue. He will restore. Jesus said, just say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Hey, steal the Bible. Use it. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I know you can do this, but I don't, I don't, I don't have faith. I need you to help me. All right, are we ready to scream amen? Here we go. Our Savior, we're going to see in the next part that our Savior is powerful. Powerful. He's powerful. Look what he says. Jesus says, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you come out of him and enter him. My mic, no? Okay. Philippians 2, 9. This should get us excited. This got me, yesterday I was, you know, hopping up and down in the room upstairs. I shouldn't have, but I was. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. This is what the Bible says. It says, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that our Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen? Romans 8, 37 through 39, it says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. This is a big couple of verses coming up. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, I don't think there's anything else, will be, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's powerful. Amen? Amen? What I love is not only did Jesus heal this boy, but he secured his future. If you read it very carefully, what did he say? Enter him no more. He secured his future. The enemy won't go quietly. Please understand. He won't go quietly, but he will go. He has to go. When Jesus says go, he has to go. Don't let Satan fool you. Don't let Satan fool you. He has to go. So don't give up. Be persistent. Pray. Bring family. Bring friends. Bring enemies to Jesus. And by the way, look, when we read real quickly, it says that the boy looked dead. Basically, he was kind of dead looking. Many people thought he was dead. Sometimes when we pray, the situation seems dead, doesn't it? We have problems, we pray, and it just seems dead. Everything is just kind of quiet. It seems dead. This boy looked dead. So, so I, I could just imagine the guy, the guy, the father, he's like, oh great, I came to you for you to help me. Now he's dead. He's even worse than when we started. Now, what does Jesus do? He goes down, he grabs the boy, and he picks him up. Many scholars believe that that was another miracle just not recorded. The kid was actually dead, and he raised him from the dead. Your, your situation may seem dead. Your situation may seem like it's just not working. 
But Jesus never stops working. Please understand that. Jesus never stops working. Listen, there's only one way, two ways here. Either believe it or you don't. There's, there's no in the middle. There's no I believe today, I don't believe tomorrow, I believe today, I don't believe. Honestly, that's just, the Bible actually calls that double-minded. You can't do that. You can't be here. You can't, Lord, I believe. Tomorrow, I don't believe. Lord, I believe. When we leave here, my prayer is we walk out this door and we say, Lord, all things are possible with you, Jesus, and I'm not backing down. I'm not backing down from this thought in my heart and mind. Why? Because your word says it. And honestly, the Bible says God can't lie. So if he does lie, then he's a liar. You might as well just close this, pack it up, go home. Don't read the Bible anymore. He doesn't lie. He takes your imperfect faith. He shows you compassion. And with his power, he says, you know what? All things are possible. Just trust in me. All right, let's, let's wrap this up. Last, last point, last one. Verse 28 to 29. When I read this, I saw, you know what? All things are possible when we're always ready. What does the Bible says? Now look, now I'm sure the disciples were like this. I can't believe he did this again. This is unbelievable. He, I wouldn't say he embarrassed us, but he's like, he did it again. This is unbelievable. We got to find out how he did this. We got to find out how. So they get him alone. Of course, they didn't do it in public. I don't know why. Uh, you know, they, did, they get him alone. They're like, okay, Jesus, tell us your secret. What did you do? What did you do? And Jesus probably looked at him and goes, oh, Lord, patience, I need. <laughs> Jesus says prayer and fasting. Where was Jesus? On the mountaintop. Right? What was he doing? He was talking to the Father. Where were the disciples? Down below. What were they doing? Talking to everyone but the Father. There's a point Jesus was trying to make. You guys were communicating to the wrong people. You guys were talking to the wrong people. I've been reading a book. It's called Living a Prayerful Life. I say that because I'm convicted every time I open the pages. The more I read it, the more I see I am lacking so much when it comes to prayer. I'm lacking so much when it comes to prayer. For the Christian, and I'm so grateful that we have brothers and sisters in this church that love to pray, because every time I need prayer, you call like 30 people, and it's like you have this army starting to pray for you. It's great. But fuel, army, army, yeah, army. Prayer is the fuel to your engine. Prayer is the fuel to the Christian's engine. Every church is built on prayer. Every home is built on prayer. Your daily walk is built on prayer. If you're not praying, you're walking on your own. You're walking on your own. You really are. So I ask, how, are you, how much are you praying? Lord, be with me today. Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. Good night. The Bible says that we should always be praying. And I don't mean, time out, I have to pray. You pull the car over midway through, I have to pray. I don't mean that. Just keep praying. You know, God, sometimes, I heard something, it made me laugh big time. It says, you get around people sometimes, and, and, and you always have this one, I'll pray. And they're like, gracious God, I beseech thee, dost thou, you don't need, he doesn't need King James English. He doesn't need, King, he just, open heart, Lord. I don't know how to pray. I need you to help me to pray. I'm really struggling with this person at work. Lord, either you get him or I will. And I don't mean it that way. Lord, please, prevent me from saying something I shouldn't. Lord, I need your help with this brother, with this sister. Lord, this person's really frustrating me, Lord. I need your help. You have no idea how liberating that is when you say that. Lord, this person's driving me crazy. I need your help. And he does. It's almost like you're taking it and throwing it at Jesus. He wants us to do that anyway. Cast your cares upon me. He doesn't say cast your burdens upon yourself. Cast your burdens upon me. John, I'm too busy. Really? Really? You know, even the busiest servant will make time to pray. Time to pray. Pray. You drive in the morning. 30 minutes, turn off the radio and start turning on the communication. My mic is driving me crazy. Good job. Ah, take time to pray. Then Jesus says fast. 
Wait a minute, John. This I don't like. You know me. Well, me, I love to eat. I can't eat. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Now, there are times where you say, you know what? I am going to take some time out to fast a meal, fast a day. I know some people that have done three days. God bless you guys. I don't know how you do it. That's not what Jesus is saying. Yes, you can do that. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Why? What is he saying? There are, honestly, have there been times in our lives where we've prayed and we've fasted and nothing happens? You're like, okay, I did what your Bible commanded. What's the deal? Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Jesus was speaking about sin. Quietly, he was kind of speaking about sin. In which way? You know what, John? I don't want to hear about sin right now. I don't want to hear about I don't like that word, sin. I'm sorry. <sighs> One of the commentators I was reading, he said, a person might fast regularly, but, us, but un unless he masters the art of refraining from sin, his going without food is just a waste of time. I'll explain what I mean. The Christian can never put their guard down. They have to always be walking in the Spirit. What do I mean? We just read before, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the Spirit, and if you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, then you're walking in the Spirit. You're technically fasting, refraining from your flesh. But if you're giving it to your flesh, and you fast food, well, what's the use? What is fasting anyway? What is fasting? What is fasting? Anybody? What is fasting? What? When the spirit leads, right? When the spirit leads? But if you're, if you're allowing the flesh to lead, well, where's the spirit? It's kind of back seat. We as Christians, we have to understand that we can never put our guard down. Please understand that there's no days off for the Christian. There's no days off for the Christian. We should all get up every morning and put on that armor and always walk in the Spirit. Imagine God, I wrote, I wrote to myself, I was, I was thinking, imagine God took a day off. Could you imagine? We'd be doomed. One day without His grace. One day without His mercy. One day without His forgiveness. One day without His love. You feel unloved now. Imagine when He doesn't love you for one day. I read somewhere, it says, Blessed is the man who regularly spring cleans his soul. Honestly, as Christians today, we should always be spring cleaning our soul. We should be saying, Lord, if there's something, wash me, clean me. Please make me new. Please make me new. I want to walk in the Spirit. Look, as I wrap up, this is, I'm just going to say a couple of things. First is this, only one thing, one thing is the greatest challenge to the ministry of Jesus. One thing. I said it before, you know what it is? Unbelief. One thing hinders the ministry of Christ, unbelief. Hebrews 13.8 says what? Let's read it together. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do we believe that? Do we? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Who the Bible says He is, is who He is today. Why do we limit that? Why do we change that? Why? Just because he, what he did in the Bible, he can't do today? Why? Because we're 2,000 years later? He can do it. He will do it. He will do it. But understand one thing. Look, the, the disciples tried everything on their own. Stop trying everything on your own. Stop trying everything on your own. Please stop trying. I say it again. Please stop. They say repetitive is good for memorization. Stop trying everything on your own. Because the disciples learned a lesson that day. And I pray that we learn the same lesson. And it's this. That as Jesus said it himself in John 15, 5. He says, without me, you can't do anything. It's that easy. It's not easy. It is that easy. Jesus said it. It's that easy.
What is it? Jesus is the answer to everything. All things are possible, but you know what? They're only possible by one name, and that's Jesus. Nobody else. Jesus. We should have said amen there. Amen! All things are possible with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we, as we just come to a close here, Lord, we do thank you so very much. We thank you, Lord. Uh, I, I think the word thank you doesn't describe what we feel, Lord. The things that you've done for us, Lord, does not describe. And, and, and I think the word thank you is not enough. Lord, we should be worshiping you every single moment of every day, Lord, because you don't leave us as orphans, because you never, ever leave us alone. Father, I pray for everyone here. I pray for, for, for those that are going specifically through certain struggles in their lives, Lord. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you as Savior. Father, I pray that they see that you love them so much that you sent your Son, Jesus, to die on the cross for their sins, Lord, that they understand that without Jesus, they can't be saved. There's nothing they can do. They can't pray enough. They can't work enough. It's only Jesus. Lord, your Bible says, Lord Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Father, I pray that you touch hearts today to make them understand that it is only through you, Jesus, that there's salvation. That only through you there's fullness of joy. Only through you there's peace in every storm. And only through you lie all the goodness, all the answers of our lives. Father, we just thank you. And I pray, Lord, that this word today radically touches us. And as we go out, Lord, may we be changed. May we be refreshed, new, just warriors for you, Jesus. We just thank you so much, Lord. And um, we praise you. We lift everything up to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.